Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And then Matthew 4, starting at verse 18, says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. As we sing this song, have the courage and the faith to, to drop what you're doing. If God calls you somewhere, then go wholeheartedly.
fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, he is my life. I want to be tried. whatever you desire. Lord, give my Before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before. My failure carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So, what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation. Your spirit. to declare your promise my soul now to stand so what can I say and what can I do but offer this heart oh Of the one 
one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. I am is yours. I'll stand, I'll stand with arms high and heart up and in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. stand so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is yours all I am all I am is yours. Jesus, I pray that our daily declaration to you will be, all I am is yours. All I have is yours. Help us to constantly be willing to give our all for the one who gave it all. Jesus, I pray that you would just cultivate in us a heart that is willing to sacrifice anything, a heart that is willing to go anywhere for you. heart that is willing to say yes if you tell us to say yes, a heart that is willing to, to stay if you're saying stay and go if you're saying go. Jesus, I pray that we will constantly be looking to you for guidance, for direction, that we will constantly be in the position and posture of surrender. Pray that we will be constantly ready to receive what you have for us because we know you are the giver of good, of good gifts and your ways are better than anything we could ever conceive. And I pray that in this time as Dr. Janev comes to share yet again, I pray that we would just open our minds, open our hearts, help us to be receptive to whatever it is that you want to 
say to us. And I pray this in your sweet name. Amen. Good morning, church. Can you help me give it up for the band, please? Also, um, for the people that sit upstairs and run the sound system, you, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. You, I usually tell them that at our church, you guys are like hockey goalies. Nobody pays attention to you until there's a mistake. Then the lights flash and the buzzers go and everybody looking at you. But as long as you're doing your job, nobody looking at you. So it's good for them to get a little love. I want to also uh, tell you, I was at uh, dinner last night with Steve and Eileen, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Lennox and his wife. And uh, man, they love you guys. They love you so much. They, they talk about you and I mean by name and the school and what's happening here, so I don't know how often you get in a room where you get to hear that, but let me say it on their behalf. You are foremost in their minds, and they love being with you as a community, people of God. This is my last chance to spend a few minutes with you, and I've only got 30 minutes, and so can I just get right to it? Be all right. <laughs> okay. We started uh, yesterday morning talking about uh, the call. I said I was going to spend three times talking about the call and hopefully in graduating degrees. The first call that you will receive in your life, I think, is a call to be a disciple. The call to be a disciple is not the same thing as a call to preach or a call to be a minister or a missionary or anything else. It's a call to follow Jesus. Uh, and it's a call to believe in Jesus and to believe what Jesus believes. The purpose of discipleship is the transformation of our instincts, our defaults, not just our behaviors. Too much emphasis is put on behavior modification in the name of discipleship, and that's never the point. It, it helps, but it's on the way to the point. The point is that Christ may be fully formed in us. Beyond that, we said, there's a call to take your ministry into something larger than just your ministry. Your temptation at this age is to focus on the next thing, and believe me, I get that. When I graduated... I didn't know where I was going. I graduated in May, and there wasn't anybody even wanted to talk to me. Um, and I finally got one interview uh, in July to be a youth pastor. <laughs> Can you imagine me being a youth pastor? Holy cow, that'd be the kiss of death for that church. So that, that interview was fairly short, and he realized, no, this ain't the guy, so I went back to nothing. So I get, I get the pressure, the urgency that says, I've got to find something and land, and then I can figure the rest of my life out. What I want for you is that while you're answering that question, God will take your career, and he will pull it into something larger than your career, which is the thing that God is doing in this world. As I said last night, God is creating an alternative community to the one that is out there. And it's just desirable for people when they see it. I wish I could have given you examples last night uh, of ministries in our church recently that have started in the last few years and, and how those ministries are addressing needs of justice and loyalty or allegiance and sense of holiness. My point is simply to say, when you get those things together, the world notices that, because they're hungry for it. They just don't have words for that hunger. When they see it, they'll go after it. Now, today, I want to focus on the last leg, which is to say that 
Sometimes God will call you not only into something larger, but into something hard. <laughs> Are you all right? So I start with a passage from the book of Jonah. Have you heard this guy's story? This religious school, you've heard the story. Let me start at the end. The question that Yahweh puts to the prophet is, why shouldn't I care about that city? The city has 120,000 people in it. The region of St. John has 135,000. If you translate that, you'd say, Yahweh is saying to you this morning, why shouldn't I care about St. John, the region of St. John? I like the way Eugene Peterson translates that last verse in Jonah chapter 4 like this. Why can't I change my mind about Nineveh? Why can't I change my mind about Nineveh? From the beginning, the story of Jonah is not a story about a whale. It's a story about a man. And he's not just a man. He's a kind of person. He's a symbol of a tribe of people. And I belong to it. And you probably do too. These people that Jonah belongs to feel as if God has called them to be proponents of God's message to the world. These people have a strong belief in Scripture. And they see themselves as proponents of that Scripture. Therefore, they believe that they possess absolute truth. They have a strong sense of moral justice. There is a right, there is a wrong, there are therefore good people, and there are bad people, and they never confuse these lines. Good people do good things. Bad people do bad things. And with these convictions, God encounters Jonah and completely blows up his view of the world. So if you read the book right, I think you won't come away thinking about a fish swallowing a man, you'll start to think about your own convictions and the unintended consequences of those convictions. Jonah will bring you face to face with unrelenting force with some of the convictions that you already have about how the world is ordered and who is right and who isn't right. And if you let him he will challenge those convictions so you start rethinking them. And once you do that, then you can really do something in the world. Jonah shows us how our beliefs and convictions, we build them up like scaffolding around our faith and that scaffolding becomes a wall it becomes a defense he 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 shows me how something like faith that was meant to be a shelter or a refuge becomes a weapon or a wall how is it that religion which is supposed to make saints makes so many monsters How is it that the very things God invented are the things that get in God's way? The law, the covenant, the temple, the priesthood, all of these things are good things. And they end up being the problem that God has to get over in the book of Jonah. So can I give you a short summary of how it works? This will go really fast. You know the story, but I'll try to tell it best I can. There was a man named Jonah, and God came to him and said, I want you to go to Nineveh. 
Uh, Nineveh is a violent city. It is known in the region as lords of torture, the Nazis of the ancient Middle East in that time. Jonah knows this, and so instead of going to Nineveh, he decides to go in the other direction on the map to a place called Tarshish. He gets on board a boat headed for Tarshish. The Lord sends a strong, violent wind that starts tearing the ship apart. He goes into the boat, into the hull of the boat, falls asleep while the sailors are trying to hold things together. And finally, they come to approach Jonah and they say, where are you from? Who is responsible for this storm? It's like pseudo-religious language. And Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. I am the one responsible for this. If you'll take me and throw me overboard, the sea will calm down. They refuse to do it. Finally, when the storm is unrelenting, they walk Jonah to the edge of the boat and then they push him overboard and immediately the storm calms down. And the sailors don't go back to work. They make vows to Yahweh and offer sacrifices to Yahweh. Jonah sinks into the water. Giant fish comes, swallows him whole. He's down in that belly for three days and three nights, and there he prays. On the third day, the fish has had enough of him, so he spits him up, and he lands in dry ground, and while he's cleaning himself off, he hears that familiar voice again say, Go to Nineveh. Well, this time he is in the mood to listen. So he goes to Nineveh and he preaches the message the Lord gave him. Five words in the Hebrew, 40 more days and this city is toast. And they listen. This is like an Israelite going to Hamas today. Standing up and saying, 40 more days and the whole Gaza Strip is toast. And they listen. And they repent. And then the king hears about this. And he repents. He calls a national day of fast and prayer and repentance. And he called, this is the king of Hamas. He calls the people of Nineveh, repent of what you're doing. Perhaps the Lord will have mercy on us. And the people do repent. And God changes his mind. And when that happens, Jonah's confused. He goes out into the desert and sits down in the hot sun and he has an argument with God. <laughs> and he says to God, I knew it. I knew you were going to do this. Because you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. You always do this stuff. And therefore, the people that you should have destroyed, you let live. So it's true, isn't it, Yahweh, that if there never is punishment for evil, then there is no reason to stop evil and do what is good. Because what am I doing good for if evil doesn't get punished? His moral categories are shifting. His little world of Right, wrong, good, evil, it's getting broken up. Yahweh comes and causes a vine to come over the top and it grows really fast and it puts shade over him 
and he sits in the sun resting from the shade. And then the Lord sends a worm, comes in, takes a bite out of that vine, and it dies as quickly as it grew. And as the vine starts to shrivel and diminish and the sun scorches him, Jonah sits in the sun again and says to Yahweh, I want to die. Now, God is confused. And he says to Jonah, Jonah, I feel about Nineveh the way you feel about that vine. I created Nineveh like I created the vine. And yet, you're sorry that the vine is dying, but you want me to kill the Nineveh. Why shouldn't I care about Nineveh the way you care about that vine? Why can't I change what I feel about Nineveh? And the story ends just hanging there. And herein, people, is the power of the story. At the end of the story, God is crossways with His own servant. The servant of God has visions of justice that are crossways with the God He serves. And so suddenly, the servant of God is sort of like the elder son in the prodigal son. He's just sort of sitting out there alone while the father has changed his mind about Nineveh and he won't have it. Let he who has ears to hear hear what the Spirit says. To the religious people. Holiness folk. Can I point two things out pertaining to the call? I'll, I'm going to hurry. Is that right? One. Because I think this is pertinent to the calling that God puts on your life. The first one is when the call of God comes to you, It will create a dividing line in your life. From the moment you hear the call of God upon your life, um, you can only go in one of two directions. You can either go in the way He called you, which is Nineveh, or you can go in the opposite direction, which is Tarshish. The thing you cannot do is stay the same. The moment God calls you, you are caught in between those two tensions. And there's another thing about that. When God calls you, He will often call you into places like Nineveh that are hard and uncompromising. These are not things that you're passionate about. You can't see yourself doing them. It's not the place where your greatest joy and the world's deepest need mix. That would be nice. It's not where you get to use your talents and you get to find yourself. Sometimes God will call you into places that seem outrageous to you and hard and unthinkable. But if you don't go, He won't leave you alone. He will send winds to disrupt your comfortable little life. Because you don't want to be with the Nazis of the ancient East. You'll find Tarshish. It's a safe city, not a religious one. But you can get married there. You can have children there. You can build a career there. You can even be religious if you want to, but you don't have to be. But it's safe, and it's out of the way, and nobody will find you. But that's just the problem. Sometimes God will say, I need you to be in the thick of it where it's hard. And there is no thank yous. And you'll fail more than you'll succeed. But here's the deal, son or daughter. I'm going to Nineveh. 
So if you want to be with me, you have to go into hard things. If you do what God calls you to do, your life will get harder, not easier. But it will get better. Because God is there. I remember 2.30 in the morning while my family slept having this argument with God in the living room. I was so mad. I said, you could fix this, you could change this whole thing, and you do not a thing. What is the difference between a God who never answers prayer and no God at all? Tell me. Nothing. I said, no wonder you have so few friends. My enemies are nicer than this. You can fix this. I was angry. I heard a voice say, I could fix it. But what if I just get in it with you? So that what happens to you happens to me at the same time. If you get hit, I get hit at the same time. If you go down, I go down. We both go down at the same time. And that's when it occurred to me, you guys, I didn't want answers. I wanted company. I wanted somebody to be in the fix with me. I just wanted somebody there. And once I had that, now 3.34 in the morning, I said, I'll take that. Okay, I can do that. We'll do it together then. If we lose, we lose. In the best of company. You may have to make that decision. Somebody needs to tell you. But there's one more thing. The call of Jonah is not a call to a position. You can't say, oh, I'm called to be a minister. He was not called to be a missionary. He was called to preach. It's not a position, it's a function. So you can't say, well, I'm pursuing the ministry, therefore I'm answering my call. Maybe, maybe not. The call of God is to a function that sometimes uses a position, but just as often not. If a person is not in the church as a minister, and I have hundreds of them, they can be just as effective as Jonah preaching the gospel in wildly secular places. So you can't just say, well, I'll just become a minister or missionary. That don't fix it. This is a call to say impossible things in some of the most hostile environments, in unrelenting ways, because you believe in those things, not because you're trying to change people. Remember? Your boundaries of good and evil, they're moving. God calls it may be hard but you will love it in the end. Are you there? You're quiet. Last one. Uh, when God calls, on your, way to, on your way to Nineveh, there will have to be a death and resurrection. Jonah gets on board the boat and he goes into the hull of the ship and he falls asleep. And while the storm starts to batter the ship, the sailors on board, according to the text, are each calling out to their own gods. Oh, this is beautiful. You have multiple cultures on board of a ship, each calling out to a different god. Uh, The Midrash, which is Jewish commentary on these teachings, says that the sailors represent the nations of the world. So what you have on board this boat is the servant of God falling asleep while the nations of the world are scrambling to hold things together. The servant of God is asleep 
while the ship is coming apart. And it's not the servant of Yahweh, it's the servants of other religions that are holding the ship together. This is where it rattles your category. Servant comes down and says to Jonah, who's responsible for this? What did you do? Where are you from? He said, I am a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh. I'm the reason this is happening. If you take me to the edge of the ship and throw me over, the sea will become calm. They refuse to do it. But after the storm keeps going, they finally turn and say to Yahweh, do not hold this against us. And then deliver him into the sea. Now watch the language. It says, the Lord prepared a fish. Oh, this is a good word. It means he appointed, he created. I looked it up. The Lord actually created and prepared the fish to swallow Jonah. And then when he's gone, the sailors don't go back to work. They start making vows to Yahweh and offering sacrifices to him. That's what Jonah was supposed to be doing. And it isn't the people of God. It's the nations of the world. Are you feeling what I'm feeling? Nothing in this story is going right at this time. You've got the servant of God asleep in the boat while the nations of the world are trying to hold things together. And then you got the servant of God being pushed overboard while the nations are each praying to their own God. You can say, well, they're praying to the wrong God, but at least they're praying. Your guy's asleep. And whatever you feel about this, however this upsets you, it upset me terribly, you can't deny the storm was sent because of the servant of God. It was not sent to punish the sailors. It was sent to rattle the servant of God. And whatever you say, the fish didn't eat the sailors. He ate the good guy. This is where you look at the story and say, there's nothing happening right in this story. The bad guys are doing the right thing and the good guy isn't even there. And he get ate by somebody he served. Nothing is happening here. Maybe I don't know. Good and evil, got it figured out. Maybe, maybe God is already active in places and with people that I think are unreachable. Maybe I don't bring the gospel to anybody. Maybe it's already there. The doctrines, the systems of belief, important as they are, are part of a culture. But God has witnesses in every culture. And the servant of God knows how to take what God is already doing in that place, hard as it may be, and help them define it. Jonah goes into the belly of the fish and uh, he don't fall asleep. He starts to pray. And that's in Jonah chapter 2. Hang on, it'll move fast now if you're, if you're tracking. In Jonah chapter 2, he goes into a prayer. And as I start reading this prayer, it's strange because the language that Jonah uses in this prayer, chapter 2, is the almost sounds like the language of dying. He talks about God 
sending him to the root of the mountains. He said, you have put me in a place and hid yourself from me. I can't reach you. And then, in the middle of that prayer, he says, you will bring me up from the grave. Jonah is speaking of this as though this were a death. Then, three days later, when the fish spits him out, that becomes for him something like a resurrection. I wasn't ready for this because I always thought of the fish as a form of punishment. You're running from me. I'm going to stop you, punish you. Then you will change your mind. But when I get into Matthew chapter 12 or Luke chapter 11, Jesus refers to this incident twice in the language of his own death and resurrection. He says, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And he was speaking of his own death and resurrection. And that's the moment where you say, whatever else you know about the Jonah story, maybe Jesus knows something you don't know because he's likening it to his own death and resurrection. Why, I thought, would Jesus use a punishment as a model for his own death and resurrection? Then it occurred to me, Maybe this isn't just a punishment. Maybe this is a preparation. You're on your way to Nineveh. It's a hard city. And you're coming with all of these assumptions. Your strong sense of justice, clear moral boundaries, deep truth embedded in you, and how you're going to share that with the world. That's got to die, brother, because that won't work in Nineveh. You can't come in with this superiority complex. You have to come in with someone who has tasted death. What dies on the way to Nineveh are all of your assumptions. What dies are these clear, hard boundaries with simple answers in the belly, you discover that life is complex. And the categories are not as clear. And the people that were once evil, there's something in them where God is active. And the people that were good, oh, there's something in them that you don't like. You wouldn't know that unless you spent time in the belly. So I thought, Whenever God calls me to hard things, my tendency is to try to do it on my own power, my talent. My, you know, my style is to figure it out. Everything can be figured out, you know. And once I do that, then I'll just work my plan. But that doesn't work in hard places. God will call you to hard places. And on your way there, He will lead you to a death and resurrection. So what comes out of that death will be something new and something humble and something permeable, something vulnerable that can be got. And that is a beautiful place to be. But it's hard. Last story. I was... Um, I think about you guys because I know um, when I was 17 years old, I, I'm a preacher's kid. And my dad, pretty good preacher, a great pastor. 17 years old, I'm sitting in Day Memorial Chapel in the Hastings Wesleyan Campground, West Michigan. And I hear this guy, Bob Zool, and he starts to give his testimony. And he says, let me tell you what to look for if you're called into ministry. And he started listing the qualities. He got halfway through his list. I was sitting in back. I just remember going, shoot. 
because he was describing me to a T. I got up and I walked out of there and I was quiet. And I went home for the next month or two. I didn't say a thing, but I knew God was saying, I, 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 I want you to be a minister. And I thought, oh man, I can't do that. My dad's a minister. I'm going to be a bad sequel, man. They're just going to look at me and think, oh, geez, but <laughs> it wasn't as good as the original. And so finally, when I talked to him about it, he said, what is God calling you? I said, I think he's calling me to be a minister, and I think he's calling me to preach, and this is a stupid thing to do, Dad, because I've stuttered since I was a child. I still stutter to this day, and I don't, I'm just like, man, I'm not going to get up in front of people and make a fool of myself. I'm an introvert with all, I'm not going to do this kind of stuff, man. And I just remember my dad saying, oh, well, you're between God and the devil, God will not leave you alone till you say yes, and the devil won't leave you alone till you say no. From this day on, you will never be alone. you got to decide. So I did decide. I went to college. I checked in. <laughs> it's Christian education. It's like, because there ain't no way I'm going to be a minister. It lasted a year. In the second year, I was there in Williams Hall. Remember that? Bill Hall, they called it. I'm at the far end, room 322, and I'm angry at God. I'm angry at the world. I'm angry at the school, and my dad's down there for a meeting, and he gets ready to leave. He just comes to say hi, and he gets ready to leave, you guys. I remember him going down the stairs, and he stood at the landing, and as he stood, he looked up, and he said, as I said, see you later, he stopped and said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. He turned around, came back up the stairs, went into the room, and sat there more than two hours. I don't remember what he said, but all I can remember as I poured everything out to him, he just kept saying, you got to die, son. you got to die. You want to serve God, but you also have an ego. And you can't do that. You can't glorify God and yourself at the same time. You've got to die. He said, I don't know how. I don't believe in this. I'm just going to pray and it's done stuff. I don't know how to do it. He said, it'll be slow. It'll be hard. There will be failures. But you will let things go. You'll be dying for a while, and then there will be a moment when it's done. And that's exactly what happened. Therefore, I have learned far more in my failures and in my pain than I have in any amount of success. I've come to believe that life is not a festival. Life is a predicament. And it is better to be in it with one like God so this is my call to you guys this morning. I know you guys are talented. I know you feel called. I know you're preparing because when you get out there, you want to be ready. But the unintended consequence of that is that it can make you self-reliant. You can't do what God is calling you to do unless you die. There has to be a death. Your assumptions, your way of categorizing things, of seeing things. It's got to die. Band's going to play in a moment, and as they play, if God is speaking to you this morning, and that's what you hear Him say, I am calling you into hard places. And I know it's not fun, but that's where I'm going. I'll see you there. And on the way, if you hear him say, you got to let go. Brother, honey, you got to let go. I will do this. I'll get out of the way. You listen to God, and if he's saying something like that to you, maybe you'll stay, maybe you'll come forward and kneel, but We'll pray when it's over, but I'll get out of the way. 
and let God in you talk. This next song that we're going to sing is Send Me. And we usually do this during holiness, or this is holiness, during missions emphasis week. But it's fitting because as Dr. Neff was just saying, God doesn't always send us where we want to go. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were sent into the fire. I don't think they wanted to go into fire. But scripture tells us that when the king looked in, he saw a fourth person. I challenge you this morning as we reflect on the messages that we've been given this week to really check your heart and just ponder where God is sending you and what's your heart posture towards that. Because God might be sending you somewhere that you're not comfortable. He might be sending some, you somewhere that you're not allowed to be who you truly are. He may be sending you somewhere that is going to be difficult and have obstacles. And what are you going to do about that? Are you going to listen to him and be obedient? Or are you going to take the easy route? So I want you all to take a posture of reflection right now and just really talk to God and ask him. And when you're ready, you can stand and go pray. Just take whatever posture you feel comfortable.
standing in your glory I'll be glad I chose to say here I am Lord send me well done good and faithful I live to hear you say here I am Lord send me when I'm standing standing in to say, here I am, Lord, send me, well done, good and faithful, I live to hear you say, here I am, Lord, send me, here I am.
reflect how much I love you, I love you, and before you even ask, well, my answer will be yes, cause I love you, I love you. with your people this morning I thank you for calling us into anything that you're doing because that matters more than anything else for those that are praying in front I pray that you would meet them there in extraordinary if quiet ways for those of us that sit and ponder and listen, our hearts are open to you right now. I pray you would continue to speak. And when we go from this place, <clears throat> help us to go with a humble boldness. In a quiet reliance on the Holy Spirit who has called this meeting and filled it himself. Bless each and every one of these, I pray in Jesus' great name. Let the church say amen. amen. Thank you for letting me be with you guys. We're going to stay as long as it takes, but I'm going to step aside.